Anders Breivik grew to believe that his country was being taken over by Islamization, and he believed that he needed to do something about it. He spent nine years planning and preparing to take as many lives as he could in an effort to start a civil war. This is Monsters. The Kingdom of Norway is not only the northernmost country in Europe, it's one of the northernmost countries in the world. Known widely for their Viking heritage and Norse mythology, Norway is also one of the places you can see the Northern Lights. It's home to the Svalbard Seed Vault, Birenberg, the world's northernmost volcano, and the world's longest tunnel at 15 miles or 24 and a half kilometers. Though Roald Dahl was raised in Wales, he was actually born in Norway, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was inspired by the Freya Chocolate Factory in Oslo. Norway has one of the lowest crime rates in the world, having reported 31 murders in 2020. With a population of about 5.4 million people, this would be like the United States reporting 1,892 murders in the same year, which would be amazing since there were actually 21,570. Unfortunately, even a country with a very low crime rate, such as Norway, still has human beings who decide to carry out some of the most heinous acts imaginable. Anders Breivik was born on February 13, 1979, in Oslo, Norway, to Jens and Vanka Breivik. Jens was a divorced father of three. He had two sons and a daughter with his first wife, before meeting Vanka in the basement laundry room of their apartment complex. She already had a four-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, with a man who had only seen her once and didn't seem interested in being a father. A few months after meeting Jens, she found herself pregnant and the two had a quick marriage at the Norway embassy where Jens was attending a conference. He was a diplomat in the Norwegian Foreign Office. Vanka was a nurse. Vanka disliked Anders before he was even born. She claimed that he was a nasty child and believed he was kicking her on purpose. After he was born, she stopped breastfeeding him early because she said he was sucking the life out of her. Jens eventually got a job at the Norwegian embassy in London. Vanka moved with the children to live in London, but she felt that her husband was increasingly stubborn and didn't consider any other people's feelings. Vanka only lasted six months in London before she packed up and moved back to Oslo. Once there, she filed for divorce and went back to her maiden name, Baring, which was also Anders' middle name. Like Elizabeth's father, Jens wasn't that interested in being a father and it was three years before he saw his son again. Vanka wasn't any better. She said she had considered putting the kids up for foster care. She had told a medical worker that she had considered just walking away from the kids and leaving them to society. She complained that Anders was always clinging to her and he never gave her any peace. Eventually, the family counseling service began to realize that Anders didn't behave the way his mother described. They began noticing that it was her that showed signs of mental illness. Psychologists said she had an underdeveloped sense of how to relate to people along with anxiety and depression. They found her mental illness to have an overall negative effect on Anders. There was a brief period where Jens claimed he wanted to gain full custody of Anders, but when the court concluded that the boy was in no immediate danger, he withdrew his request. In 1992, when Anders became a teenager, he decided to reinvent himself as a tagger. He picked up the tagger name Morg, a supervillain from Marvel comic books. He formed a group of friends at a new school through tagging and a love of hip-hop music. Anders started breakdancing and performing in dance competitions. They started out painting on walls and fences in the neighborhood, but moved up to actually sneaking in on school property after hours or breaking into the bus station. Anders eventually began tagging in areas he knew were dominated by other taggers as an effort to show them up. Eventually, the tagging throughout Oslo became an overwhelming form of vandalism and the city began cracking down. Tagging became punishable by heavy fines and even jail time. Authorities were even more concerned with the appearance of the city in 1994 while the Winter Olympics were being held in Lillehammer, a few hours north of Oslo. While the Olympics were going on, Anders and a friend were caught tagging buses and were ordered to wash buses for two weeks. Though Anders was warned to stop or he'd be punished more severely next time, he was 14 years old and had no intention of stopping. He got arrested again and fined for tagging as a teenager. 
Soon, though, Anders' attitude that he was the best tagger around got on the nerves of the other taggers in his crew, and they cut him loose. It started by them making fun of him and graduated to them just ignoring him. Even his closest friends had had enough of his attitude, and Anders was on his own. He continued tagging either by himself or with younger kids that didn't know he was cast out from the tagging community. When he was arrested the last time, he had 43 cans of paint on him, and a rumor spread that he had ratted out other taggers. This caused Anders to become an even bigger pariah at school and got him disowned by his father. Jens had made him promise to give up tagging after his previous arrest, and now that he had broken his promise, he told his son he wanted nothing to do with him. As of the age of 15, Anders would never see his father again. By this time, Anders stopped tagging and participating in the hip-hop community and began focusing on improving his looks. He began lifting weights and is reported to have taken steroids. In his early 20s, he had plastic surgery on his nose because he was made fun of in school for having a big nose. He's also reported to have had plastic surgery on his chin and forehead as well. From the age of 18, Anders had been a member of the Progress Party. It's described as a conservative party, and in its earlier years was described as being anti-immigration. The party is really more in favor of restrictions, so only those who are in need of protection according to the UN Refugee Convention are allowed to stay in Norway. Anders most likely saw the party as more anti-immigration than it was because, though he had many childhood friends who were of Middle Eastern descent, in his adult years he had become quite Islamophobic. He grew to hate people who supported the more left-leaning Labour Party, one of whom was his own mother, who he complained was a liberal feminist. Even though Anders was exempted from military service because he was listed as his mother's caretaker, he still built a very strong knowledge of weapons and ammunition. He researched on the internet and read gun-related magazines. And that wasn't a lie to get him out of service. His mother had contracted an infection that required a drain to be implanted in her head, which needed care for quite a while. In 2002, Anders became disillusioned with the Progress Party. He had become increasingly vocal about the Islamization of the West. He believed that there would be a civil war as soon as Muslims became the majority in Norway. He became convinced that the only way to solve the problems in Norway would be an armed conflict. That year, he started a nine-year plan to finance an attack on the country. Anders had started a number of companies when he was younger in an attempt to become rich. None of them were successful, but in the fall of 2002, he began selling fake diplomas online. He had websites like diplomaservices.com and bestfakediploma.com. The sites advertised a high-quality fake degree in your field of choice within 10 days. He had an independent artist create the diplomas to order, and then they would be emailed to Anders for approval. The business took off, and Anders was making hundreds of diplomas a month. He hired an employee who he told, with them being labeled as decorative diplomas, it was legal to sell them online. The signature on the diploma was completely made up, which also was not illegal. And it's true that Anders may not have broken any specific laws, but what he was doing wasn't really acceptable in many of the countries he was selling his products in. When the media began sniffing around for information about the person who was selling fake diplomas, Anders continued for a while, but the fear of being exposed in the papers became enough that he shut down the business. According to Anders, he had made more than 2 million kroner, which would have been about 240,000 US dollars or 215,000 euros. After shutting down the fake diploma business, he lost money in the stock market and had to file for bankruptcy. He had hidden some of his assets in offshore bank accounts and used that money along with nine credit cards to finance his attack. He joined a gun club in Oslo and participated in 13 training sessions. He used his membership at the gun club as a means of obtaining weapons for his attack. In 2010, he traveled to Prague in an attempt to purchase weapons illegally spending six days in the city trying to find a connection to weapons dealers. His goal was to buy an AK-47 rifle, a Glock semi-automatic pistol, and he had hoped to also find some grenades. Anders had watched a BBC documentary that said Prague was known for being the most important transit point for illicit drugs and weapons in Europe. He had even hollowed out a space in the backseat of his Hyundai to store the weapons on his trip back home, but he was never able to find any weapons dealers. He ended up purchasing his firearms legally in Norway by filing for a gun permit with the police. 
he used his membership in the gun club to purchase a Glock 34 and used his hunting license to purchase a Ruger Mini-14 rifle. Along with practicing at the gun club, he also claimed that he used video games such as Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 and World of Warcraft as training simulations. In 2009, Anders began writing a manifesto under the name Andrew Berwick called 2083, a European Declaration of Independence. This 1518-page tome asserts that political correctness has led to social rot and blames feminism for the erosion of the fabric of the European society. A lot of the manifesto is plagiarized. He copies Paul Warrick, the Unabomber, and posts by Norwegian blogger Fjordman with titles like Boycott the United Nations and How Feminists' War Against Boys Paved the Way for Islam. Sounds like a lot of blaming someone else to me. In the writings, he praised Japan and South Korea for refusing to take in refugees and he expressed admiration for Vladimir Putin, saying he thought he was, quote, a fair and resolute leader worthy of respect, end quote. Uh, what? The last part of the manifesto described how the people he believed were responsible for the cultural genocide of the native inhabitants of Europe should be treated. Cultural Marxists, politicians, journalists, teachers, and artists. Anyone who was guilty of allowing Europe to be overtaken by feminism and Islamism. Most of these people would be sentenced to death, though some who had more minor roles would just be fined and imprisoned. Starting on January 1st, 2020, Muslims would be deported unless they converted to Christianity and changed their full name to a Christian name. All mosques would be demolished and languages like Arabic and Farsi would be banned. On top of that, any Muslims who converted to Christianity would not be allowed to travel to a country where more than a fifth of its population was Muslim for two generations. So basically, total control of a person's life based on one belief system. That kind of sounds like something that already exists that you don't like. Huh, weird. Then he went on to describe ways to kill these so-called traitors. He suggested causing a painful death by shooting them with bullets filled with pure nicotine, and instructed that if someone was too well protected to attack something they held dear. It never ceases to amaze me that there are people like this encouraging others to cause painful deaths, while claiming that someone or something else is the danger to society. The icing on this shit cake was when he described the ideal society they would be left with after the Civil War was over. There would be factories of surrogate mothers all over low-cost countries, I think he means poorer countries, and each mother would be expected to produce about 10 blonde-haired, blue-eyed children. Because, you know, you choose that. And they would also be exploring the idea of artificial uteri. So, babies being made by machines. Parents that were deemed unfit to look after their own children would have them placed with patriotic foster families. There would be no sex before marriage, and divorce would be penalized as a breach of contract. These are the writings of someone who doesn't live anywhere near reality. During this time, Anders started a farming company called Breivik Geofarm and moved to a property north of Oslo. He used farming as a cover to justify ordering large quantities of fertilizer and other chemicals to make explosives. He began collecting supplies like smoke grenades, laser sights for his guns, silencers, and extra magazines. He put together outfits that would emulate what the police wore, black tactical pants, combat boots, body armor, a helmet with visor, and arm guards. In May of 2011, Anders began building a bomb. He worked inside a red barn on the farm he rented so no one could see his activities. He told the owner of the farm he was going to start farming sugar beets. He used a hot plate to boil sulfuric acid down to a stronger concentration. It took him three days to get the sulfuric acid from 30% to a 90% concentration. He worked at night so the neighbors wouldn't notice the thick black smoke that exited the barn. He used a combination of instructions from the internet to build the bomb. He crushed aspirin tablets to extract acetyl salicylic acid. He built a frame for the bomb. He fabricated detoners out of the handles of toilet bowl brushes. 
He ordered six tons of fertilizer, but only three tons were the type that could be used to build a bomb. He figured that would keep people from becoming suspicious. He started the process of collecting supplies in a very paranoid state, constantly thinking that someone was showing up at the farm to arrest him. But gradually, he became more and more relaxed as he worked. Eventually, he began boiling the sulfuric acid during the day, not caring if the neighbors saw the smoke. After crushing the fertilizer pellets, he began synthesizing picric acid. Once he was done with a batch, he dried it in the oven and took it out to a secluded area for a test. Once fire touched the chemical, it should burn. But when the fuse got to the picric acid, nothing happened. Anders was sure that he followed the instructions properly and it caused him to lose some of his motivation. He wrote in his journal that he decided to do another test two days later. His journal read, quote, Although highly demoralized, I decided to do one last test with the PA compound. I lit the fuse, went out of range, and waited. It was probably the longest 10 seconds I've ever endured. Boom! The detonation was successful. End quote. He wrote that he drove away from the area quickly so that he didn't raise unwanted attention from anyone who heard the blast, but he returned later to inspect the blast site. At the beginning of July 2011, Anders took a trip to Tyrafjordan Lake, which had an island in it called Utoya. The island was regularly used as a summer camp for political organizations, and it was being used that month to host the Workers' Youth League, which was affiliated with the Norwegian Labor Party. Anders used the trip to study the ferry that took people across the water to the small island. He familiarized himself with the local roads and entered the coordinates into his GPS. Back at the farm, Anders was making the final preparations to his plan. He had packed up all of his gear and was about to mix the nitromethane he had made with powdered aluminum. This type of explosive is called ANFO, which stands for Ammonium Nitrate Fuel Oil. The first time ANFO was made was in 1970 and has been used by the IRA, the ETA, and Al-Qaeda, all groups that Anders researched in order to come up with his plan along with American terrorist Timothy McVeigh. On July 15th, Anders took a train to Oslo where he picked up a van from Avis Rentals. When he returned to the farm, he removed all of the Avis stickers. On July 18th, he loaded the van with the fertilizer, the internal charge, weapons, ammunition, and body armor. He had planned to take a small motorbike with him just in case he needed to use it, but it doesn't seem like he did. On July 20th, Anders drove the rented Volkswagen Crafter van to Oslo. He had printed a logo for a water treatment company and put it on the van when he parked so people wouldn't become suspicious of the smell coming from the van. Then he took his mother out to dinner. The following day, he took the train back up to the farm where he picked up a different car which had the detonator and booster in it. He drove back down to Oslo and parked the car by the van before returning to his mother's house and going to sleep. The following day would be Anders Breivik's last day as a free man. At about 8.30 on the morning of July 22nd, 2011, Anders told his mother he was going to the computer store to buy some parts. He moved the car to a spot near the executive government quarter of the capital city. Then he took a cab back to his mother's house. There, he attempted to send an email to 8,000 contacts, most of which were politicians and journalists throughout Europe. He had issues with his internet connection and had to change his plan from destroying the hard drive to leaving the computer running at his mother's house. He would ultimately send emails to 1,002 contacts. This was due to the internet service provider having a spam filter that only allowed 1,000 emails to be sent per day. The email contained a link to a YouTube video that he had made as well as a copy of his manifesto. The subject of the email was the Islamization of Western Europe and the status of the European resistance movements. The email stated, quote, Western patriot, I do not want any compensation for the work as it is a gift to you, as a fellow patriot. In fact, I ask only for one favor of you. I ask that you distribute this book to everyone you know. Please do not think that others will take care of it. Sorry to be blunt, but it does not work that way. If we, the Western European resistance, fail or become apathetic, then Western Europe will fall and your liberties with it. End quote. With the computer still working hard to send out as many emails as it could, Anders drove the van to a street lined with government buildings. 
He drove right up in front of the building that housed the Ministry of Justice and the Prime Minister's office. His goal was to position the van to send a blast out toward the building, destroying the pillars on the first floor, causing the building to collapse. There were cars parked in the way, which made him not able to get the van positioned the way he wanted. He turned and lit the fuse that was sticking through a hole in the wall between the cab and the cargo area of the van. The fuse was designed to give him six minutes before the bomb detonated. He got out of the van and made his way to his car. By now, he was dressed in full police gear, complete with fake police badge and body armor. He made his way back to Tyrefjordan Lake. At 3.25 p.m., the Volkswagen van exploded. John Vegard Lervig was right next to the van when it exploded. He was killed instantly by the pressure of the blast, even before his body was ripped apart by it. His left hand was found intact outside of the explosion, still wearing his wedding ring. His wife was expecting their first child in February. Hello? Hello? No stray help? Prime Minister Jen Stoltenberg was not in the office that day. Security called him to ensure he was all right, but he had been working from his home behind the royal palace. If Anders was hoping to kill the prime minister that day, he failed. He did manage to kill eight people and injured more than 200 in the blast. While authorities in Oslo were racing around in a state of confusion, Anders had no problem making his way up the highway to the ferry to Utøya. By the time he got to the ferry, he had to wait about 30 minutes before the next crossing. Someone had seen Anders get out of the van and enter a different vehicle and reported it to authorities. They sent out a nationwide alert to be on the lookout for that vehicle, but the local police where Anders was never received the alert. It turned out, in that police station, the computer that got the alerts was not one that was regularly manned. After a certain amount of time of inactivity, the computer screen turned off. When the alerts came into the computer, they didn't automatically turn the screen on, so nobody knew they were happening. When Anders got on the ferry, he claimed he was extra security due to the bombing in Oslo. Nobody questioned him as he had made a convincing fake ID. When he got off the ferry, Anders met with the adults in charge of the camp and suggested they go up to the main building where he would brief them on the situation. As they walked to the main building, Anders pulled his Glock pistol and shot both security guards as well as the woman that ran the camp. Some of the youths at the camp had witnessed the executions and began to run, screaming. It set off a chain reaction of panic that spread through the camp like wildfire. The problem was that most of the people on the island didn't know who was attacking them. So when Anders entered a cafe at the camp in his police costume, the campers understandably assumed he was a police officer. He told them to all gather together and then opened fire on them. He left the cafe and walked through the camp, shooting anyone he saw. Some kids tried to play dead, but Anders would walk up to any body laying on the ground and shoot them in the head just to make sure. Anders spent over an hour moving through the woods, shooting anyone who was trying to hide from his attack. Every person he hit, he made sure to shoot one or two more times in the head after they fell to the ground. It made the amount of lives he took in the attack so much higher. As he killed people attending the youth camp, people as young as 14 years old, he yelled out, quote, I will kill you all, Marxists, end quote. Police got notified of the shooting 16 minutes after it started. The captain of the ferry had managed to get a call into the medical emergencies call center and they patched him through to police. He told them that a man was dressed as a cop and was shooting up the island. Within five minutes of receiving the first call about the shooting, police were geared up and putting together a plan to get to the island. They prepared the police boat, which was just a red rubber dinghy, to use to transport officers to the island. 
In the chaos, none of them considered using the actual ferry that was meant to transport people across the water to the island. It was 30 minutes after the attack started that police finally left the station. It turned out they weren't entirely sure where Atoya was. Authorities spent at least an hour bumbling around trying to figure out what to do. When the Delta Police Tactical Unit asked where they should go, the local police had them land their helicopter at a golf course not very close to the island. Then, when members from the unit arrived at the ferry station by car, they were told to leave and meet at the golf course. On the island, Anders killed 69 people in 79 minutes. Literally every minute the police delayed getting to that island, another person died. When the Delta unit finally boarded the police boat, they were able to get 10 officers on the boat, and then they took off. It only took a few hundred meters for the overloaded boat's engine to die. Fortunately, a civilian boat was close by, and they pulled up next to the defunct dinghy. The Delta unit climbed aboard, and they were once again on their way to Atoya. While on the island, Anders considered killing himself, making himself a martyr for the cause. He knew that many people wouldn't understand what he had done, but he reminded himself that he had a plan. The first part was the manifesto, the second part was the attack, and the third part would be the trial. Then he realized that he needed to make sure he survived. The tactical unit would not hesitate to kill him. He needed to make sure he could surrender and live on to have a trial. It was 6.26 p.m., and it had been an hour and 18 minutes since he fired the first shots on the island. He used his cell phone to call the police emergency line and begin the process of turning himself in. He told the operator that he was the commander of the Norwegian resistance movement. He was on Atoya, and he had completed his mission and was ready to give himself up. He asked to be transferred to the chief of operations for the Delta unit, but the operator wasn't quite sure how to do that. Anders told him to find out and call him back on the phone, and then he hung up. But the phone Anders was using didn't have a SIM card in it, so it could only make emergency calls. This also meant that it didn't have a phone number assigned to it, so the operator didn't have the number of the caller on his screen. Just one minute after Anders called the emergency line, the first boat with Delta officers arrived on the island. As they headed north, Anders was heading south. There were still campers that didn't know the gunman was dressed as a cop, and when some girls ran up to him for help, he shot them both. As the tactical unit moved closer to the gunman, Anders killed another person, then another, and another, and another, and another. Anders traveled back to the main building to get more ammunition and was finally spotted by the Delta unit. They yelled out to identify themselves. Anders put down his rifle and walked slowly toward the officers. They yelled at him to get on the ground, which he did. After being cuffed, he told the officers that he wasn't against them. What he did was political. It was a coup d'etat. He told them that it would get worse and that the third cell had still not been activated. By this time, in Oslo, the rescue operations had been going on for hours. The scene was cleared and the police searched for other bombs. The search wouldn't turn up any other explosives. Eight people were killed in the explosion and hundreds were injured. Authorities put out a message to the residents of Oslo to stay inside, as they didn't know if any more bombings were planned in other parts of the city. Once Anders was arrested on Atoya, the days-long process of recovering bodies and tending to the injured began. Sixty-nine people lay dead all over the island, ranging in age from 14 to 51. The majority of the victims were under 20 years old. There were over 100 injured, with 32 people who suffered gunshot wounds but survived. As news helicopters flew by the island, the coastline was covered with the bodies of youth who tried to make it to the water in an attempt to escape the gunmen. Some people are still out in the water, swimming near the island. Anders Breivik claimed that his massacre was self-defense. He became so overcome with hatred for Islam and feminism that he believed that teenagers were a danger to himself and his country because they believed in something different than he did. He decided that his ideals were so important that other people deserved to die over them. He executed them for believing in something different, and they were the dangers to the country? Right. In order to not reduce the manpower that was clearing the island and treating the wounded, Anders was taken to one of the buildings on the island and interrogated there. 
He told him that he was the leader of the Knights Templar, which was started in 2002 with delegates from 12 countries. That was a lie. Anders was the sole individual that had anything to do with his plot. He then told them that they needed to negotiate with him if they wanted to save 300 lives. This was another lie. Now that he was under arrest, nobody else was in danger. He claimed that his cell had over 15,000 sympathizers, many of whom were inside the police. That was a lie. Nobody knew about Anders' ridiculous civil war. Anders may not have been alone in his beliefs, but he was alone in the actions he took over them. Anders was charged with violating paragraph 147A of the Norwegian Criminal Code destabilizing or destroying basic functions of society, and creating serious fear in the population, both acts of terrorism in Norway. At a pretrial hearing in February of 2012, Anders made a statement demanding to be released and treated as a hero for his preemptive attack against traitors. His request was denied. At trial, Anders made an opening statement where he said he wasn't afraid of prison because he had spent his entire life in prison where he was never able to express himself. I mean, he was told to stop tagging because he was defacing other people's property, and he was forced to stop selling fake diplomas because it was just plain wrong. So yeah, he was in such a prison. What a horrible life. The defense called witnesses to the stand who agreed with Anders' warped views representatives of Stop the Islamization of Norway and the Norwegian Defense League. Somehow, the defense thought that, just because there were other people who believed the same thing as Anders, that made it okay for him to murder 77 people and injure hundreds more. Now, it only takes a tiny bit of effort to look these groups up and see that they're not highly populated. These two groups together held a rally in Stavanger in 2012, and there were an estimated 40 people in attendance. Not really what I would call a great example of a common ideal. Unfortunately, most of the trial was about Anders' political views and how he saw himself as some sort of defender of the nation. It wasn't about the fact that he took 77 innocent lives. Then, the survivors began to testify. Villiar Hansen was 18 years old when he was shot five times by Anders Breivik. Bullets entered his head, his shoulder, his forearm, his left hand, and grazed his thigh. He was in a coma for six days where doctors were doubtful that he would survive. He lost the sight in his right eye, suffered brain damage, and had three fingers amputated. He understandably suffers from anxiety and paranoia. His best friend was killed in the attack, but his little brother was able to escape unharmed. He testified about his condition and how it has affected his life. He showed he still had a sense of humor, though, when he was asked about losing sight in one of his eyes, and he said it was useful because he didn't have to look that way, and pointed towards Anders. On August 24, 2012, Anders Breivik was found guilty and sentenced to containment. That is a special prison sentence called preventative detention that could be extended indefinitely. He would be sentenced to 10 to 21 years in prison as a maximum sentence in Norway. But with containment, he will most likely spend the rest of his life in prison. Anders did not appeal his conviction. He did file a civil lawsuit against the government of Norway, though. He claimed that the conditions of his imprisonment was a human rights violation. Oh, well, what about murdering someone? Does that not count as violating that human's rights? Anyway, even though he had a computer and a PlayStation and a gym, he believes he's being treated unfairly. His correspondence regularly gets confiscated, and he's held in solitary for much of his imprisonment. This is in an effort to keep him from organizing other attacks, something that authorities know he would try to do. When the civil trial commenced, Anders insisted on displaying a Nazi salute after entering the courtroom and having his handcuffs removed. He complained about being handcuffed too much and that his windows didn't provide enough natural light. One of his complaints was that he didn't get enough butter with his bread. He got enough for two slices, maybe he could ration it out for three, but they knew he always ate four pieces of bread, and that meant he had to eat one slice dry. Oh, the humanity! He also complained that guards woke him up in the middle of the night to make sure he was still alive, and it was humiliating. You know what should make him feel humiliated? Posing for a picture in his Knights Templar uniform that he made. He made up a high-ranking position and made a uniform for that position. 
Then he gave himself a bunch of medals. All those medals are meaningless because he just made them up for himself. Ten years later, it's important to note that Anders' civil war never came to fruition. Obviously, the major reason was because he didn't have representatives in 12 different countries and he didn't have 15,000 sympathizers. He was just him and his own crazy ideas. In fact, it seems that he might have actually had the opposite effect. In the days following the attacks, interest in all political parties' youth leagues significantly increased. Membership in the main parties also increased, and it's reported that by the August after the attacks, the Conservative Party and the Progress Party had signed up over a thousand new members, but the Labour Party had signed up 6,000 new members. The fear that Anders wanted to spread only worked as an immediate reaction. At the end of the day, he showed people just how wrong he was and inspired more people to sign up to take action to drive the country farther away from what his vision of a perfect Europe would be. He was publicly telling people that his answer to the problem he saw in the country was to literally slaughter people in the streets and was surprised when more people wanted to stop him than join him. In the 2013 Norwegian parliamentary election, 33 people who ran in the Labour Party were survivors from the attack on Nutoya. Four were elected. For a detailed account of Anders Breivik and the attacks on Oslo and Nutoya, check out the book One of Us by Osna Sierstad. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.